Hello and welcome to the Second Drafts podcast, everything you need to write, edit, and publish your way. I'm Jeremy. I'm EJ. And today on Second Drafts, we'll be talking about what we've been uh, reading and watching recently and uh, what we think of them from a writing standpoint. And uh, we're not just limiting it to uh, books there because, of course, screenwriting is also uh, part of a writing process. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And uh, just before we start there, uh, except for this brief aside, I promise I will not talk about The Martian. <laughs> oh, here we go. Because I've already okay. done that enough, so <laughs> moving on. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, first we're going to talk about uh, books that we've uh, been recently reading there. Uh, for myself, uh, I've been... Uh, a little too busy, unfortunately, to finish it there, but I read most of the first book of The Song of Ice and Fire, and uh, I have been watching the series, so I'm all caught up on that. Uh, have you... You've uh, read the books there, have you, Ethan? Or um, Yeah, actually, I th- think I've read about the first three, maybe almost up to four books. Okay. I understand they're quite a bit farther now. I think it's like number five or six by this time yeah i think uh fifth or six or the sixth one is about to come out i think soon yeah maybe (laughs) they take quite a while to write and i can understand why those things were huge yeah (laughs) huge tomes and uh very intricate as well which uh from a writing standpoint is very interesting just uh even Reading about his uh, George R. R. Martin's writing process is interesting. Um, from what I've heard, he actually has a, a fan who he uh, kind of gets help from. Um, oh, really? This fan has been running a, basically like a Wikipedia site almost for the series and like the different relationships between the characters and the houses and stuff like that. And okay. sometimes if uh, George R. R. Martin uh, is unsure of a certain thing, I think he uh, actually consults with that fan about that. Oh, that's <laughs> that's very cool. Yeah, and even the uh, showrunners, too, also consult with this guy. So it's, uh, it's very interesting just even uh, how a fan was able to kind of uh, get into that situation to that point yeah and uh i'm not sure but uh i don't think that he's a writer himself uh if he is then that's probably uh, helped expand his um his renown but uh if he's just a fan that that he's almost created a job (laughs) (laughs) yes yeah i actually wonder maybe we one can find out that you know i think a fan like that wouldn't you know easily accept payment but you know imagine after a while if he's useful enough to the guy you never know it might be a full-time job to do that if you do a good job enough never do it for free <laughs> fair enough <laughs> <laughs> and uh just reading uh the first book in the series and watching that first season i uh thought about this after the fact, but it's really a masterpiece when it comes to character drama, because when you think about the actual plot of that novel, that first novel, not really Mm -hmm. much happens. Like, oh, you were going to say something? Uh, No, 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 that's fine. (laughs) I was just about to agree with you. That's, yeah, you you get to the end, end of the book and you think you know, what exactly happened now? You can probably tick off uh, the major plot movements, you know, the turning point on the one hand, but still the book feels quite packed. Yeah. So uh, a little bit of spoilers incoming, obviously, but uh, like in the first book, uh, when you think about it, it starts off with the death of uh, a character who, mm-hmm. you know, you learn later on, of course, that becomes a major event. Uh, kind of starting off the series of events of that song, Lice and Fire. 
Yeah. And then, uh, again, spoilers, one of the main characters dies. So that's one major plot point there. And then uh, across the sea, you have another of the main characters who uh, basically joins this uh, troop of natives over there and uh, turns into a queen, which, you know, it might seem like a big uh, situation happening, but that's literally all that happens in that whole book for her character. She goes from basically uh, nothing to that queen standpoint in pretty much the first few chapters of her story. And then from there, it's just a character drama between her and other people. And because of the characters being so interesting, like you'd be forgiven for thinking that a lot happens in the books. Yeah, yeah, that's really well done. Um, I think it's quite a, a spell he cast on you during the story, and <laughs> by the end of you take stock, so, okay. Very entertaining, very awesome, but, you know, not a lot has happened. <laughs> it's good. I like it when, a, when an author gets to do something like that. And uh, I must say, his, uh, and uh, have you watched the show, the, the TV show as well? I'm guessing. Yeah, I'm all caught up on the show there, so. Okay. Where where is it now? Sorry for having to ask, but you know, how far along in the story is the show? Well, being in South Africa, you can be forgiven for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Look, it's it's available on the shelves. I just uh, I think because I've because I've read the books, uh, most of them I I tend not to to favor the show. Yeah. You know I. Um, but I must say one thing I noticed be- between the show and the books is that uh, they did not change a lot of the dialogue. Mm-hmm. I think uh, George Martin's dialogue is just so spot on in just about every instance that they took that dialogue straight out of the books and just rendered it on screen for the show, which is very nice. It was very really cool to recognize. Yeah. And it's very distinctive dialogue, and it's very good. That's one thing. It'll definitely uh, be interesting to, to kind of answer your question there. They have actually uh, fully caught up now. So uh, they don't have the books to rely on now. So <laughs> from that writing standpoint, it's going to be interesting to see if they can mm. uh, kind of keep up the quality uh, when they do the next season. So season six. Yes. Because last I heard, they're not going to wait for George to finish the books. They're just going to go on and write their own story going forward. And... That's gonna. If that's the case, then that's gonna create a very interesting, uh, you know, kind of universe disparity where you're gonna, you know, is, is George Martin going to take cues from how this the TV show develops? Is he gonna write his own thing and we're gonna have diverging timelines, <laughs> completely different things happen? <laughs> it's uh, well, stuff has already happened that's uh, quite different from the books. Like I. Have, kind of uh, kept up on that side of things like reading the differences between the books and the okay. and the show and definitely uh, some things have diverged quite a bit but from what I understand uh, they do consult with him quite a bit so I don't think it will okay. diverge that much but uh, okay. it definitely will be interesting to see kind of what happens I think probably what will end up happening is um we'll get basically a more detailed version of events in the books and yeah. then have that series kind of uh, condensed form of that. Yeah. But one thing that I would worry about is that, I mean, there are still two books outstanding I see here now, The Winds of Winter and The Dream of Spring. Mm-hmm. So even if they're quite different, if they don't diverge on the major plot points, then the, the series is going to be... Kind of a bit of a spoiler, yeah. isn't it, for the books? Because <laughs> you know, by the like at the end of a book, the big climactic scene or something that happens, a certain character that dies or lives, you if you've watched the series, you kind of can have a pretty good idea. Maybe I don't know. It's something I wonder about. <laughs> oh, they they've definitely already entered that territory uh, as it is. So <laughs> they've spoiled a couple things. And I definitely have to get back to the. To the series and the books as well, because this will be interesting to see how it develops. 
Well, I definitely uh, I like the series a lot, and uh, I think it has uh, it's probably influenced a little bit of my writing as well. Just um, on the standpoint of uh, like not being afraid to kill off main characters, and yeah, yeah that's that's the guy to learn from. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's what you need to go for. Definitely, just like the realistic consequences that uh, happen. Like, you know, you have sometimes uh, in other ones, like, they have plot armor, as it were. And yeah. Bulletproof characters. Yeah. And uh, with his books, there no one is safe, pretty much. So it's... Uh, I think that's definitely something that uh, people should... It's a, it's a good takeaway from, mm. uh, from the books. So, uh, have you been influenced in that regard? Uh, are you going to kill off a couple people in your next book? <laughs> uh, I just might, <laughs> I think. Um, I wonder sometimes how many of the characters he creates, specifically knowing that he's going to kill them off. <laughs> because it's, it's, I think it's easy to kill off a character if you create him for that purpose. But when it comes to your your real, your true characters that you create for the long haul and deciding to kill one of those off bad is not an easy thing. Yeah, it would... And in the end... Oh, you were going to say that? Maybe the, maybe the trick is exactly that, to introduce a character as if it's a long haul character, but knowing behind the scenes that actually it's just a short-term character there to be, you know, fodder. And that's, I think that's a skill that a writer can definitely look at working on. Yeah, because uh, I know for myself, like when I'm thinking about uh, plot-wise, uh, there's definitely plot moments which I think about in advance. But from his standpoint, uh, would he have to think about it from a character uh, point? Like these things are going to happen to these characters, and then like, does he really know what's going to happen to that character, or does he kind of just let it? play out and flow more naturally like he kind of just has these plot points and writes about only the characters and then uh what happens after these plot points happen sort of thing interesting kind of thought experiment with that i feel it'd be interesting to know how he does yeah. it i think you can do it either way perhaps so uh one thing that i mentioned in a previous podcast uh was about the wheel of time and I thought mm-hmm. it'd be good to kind of go back to that a little bit because uh, you love The Wheel of Time, right? Oh, definitely. <laughs> it's one of my favorite series. You've uh, Have you read all of them? All of them the whole time? I've read every single book, all 14 of them. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. I think you didn't get too far through it, as I understand it. You kind of... Yeah, I, I, uh, I gave up after, I think it was the fifth book. And it's definitely not for the best reasons. I'll probably try and get back into it again there. But okay. it was just, I was so annoyed <laughs> at certain characters. <laughs> and how so? Uh, it was um, the, I can't remember her name now, but there was one of the female characters. And I can understand the viewpoint but they just kept mentioning the same thing over and over again. So it's like she has this uh, hate on basically for men. And it just felt like this character mentioned it almost like every five paragraphs. She was saying something like, <laughs> oh, foolish man or something like that. And I'm like, okay, I, oh. I get it. Please stop. Is this like the, the slightly the slightly older woman that came from the two rivers? Oh. The naive character was it? Was it her? Uh, yeah, and she found out that she had the magical powers. After, yeah, the the, the really strong one. Yeah, her. Yeah. So the <laughs> she's always talking about boxing men's ears and fool man. Yes. And yes. No, I know the character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. It's. I mean, it's a core cool part of her character to do that. But you know, maybe it could be said that it was a bit much at some point. Yeah, and I definitely, I understand that uh, that is part of her character, but 
I don't think that it needs to be mentioned every five paragraphs. <laughs> that was my own. That was my big, biggest biggest okay. gripe there. I did like the story. Um, the first book was one of my favorite books there, but uh, mm -hmm. it just kind of, for me, unfortunately, went a little downhill. Does it get better after with that side of things? <laughs> Do you? Well, <laughs> well, I hope so for your sake, but uh, I can't honestly say because that particular thing didn't bother me so much okay. so i'm not sure but um see that's the thing i don't want to give you any spoilers <laughs> but uh you know she does get better i would say uh she does find some value in the opposite sex i okay. might say so yeah she she does mellow out of it eventually okay maybe i'll have to go back and uh give it a third or fourth chance <laughs> yeah yeah with the wheel of time i um i read the series i think up until book six and then my varsity work you know was at that point too much and i had to focus on my studies mm -hmm. but then eventually i decided look it goes all the, i think around about that time book 11 was released mm -hmm. um so I decided, no, seriously, I want to read this. I'm still very keen on it. So I started over and I read the whole series again up till book 11. And I think I was just starting with book 11 when the news came that Robert Jordan had passed mm -hmm. away. And that was quite a blow for fans of the series, I think, <laughs> because the, yeah, that was very unfortunate. So they... But in the end, I think they carried it off okay. Yeah, I was going to ask there. I'm, I'm kind of interested myself. Like, uh, the quality, did uh, was there a noticeable dip in quality, or was it kind of stayed the same? I wouldn't call it a I wouldn't call it a dip in quality. I mean, look, Brandon Sanderson, obviously he knows what he's doing. He's a writer. Uh, I wouldn't say there's definitely a change in quality, mm -hmm. which is what I think bothered a lot of people but look honestly i can't say that um you know anyone in particular would have been able to do it better what he did you know pick up this whole series this other man's life work and complete it i i think that's an incredibly difficult thing mm -hmm. to do so it's not like i'm saying oh well he should have done it better they should have found someone better not at all but definitely when you get to those last three books you find, ah, oh, yeah, it's a good try. It's not the same, but you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> that was the best option. It's either that or have the series just end right in the middle of things. Yeah. But yeah. do you think he tried to emulate, uh, Robert Jordan's style or? I think uh, it's difficult to tell. Perhaps he tried. I know that, uh, Robert Jordan's wife who acted as his editor, uh, for all the years, she also had the final say, and she also edited these last three books. So I think some of his style did feel like it remained, okay. but uh, you know, in general, there were a couple of things where I would read it and I would stop and I would think, oh, this this wouldn't have happened under <laughs> Robert Jordan. But you know, let's let's grin and bear it <laughs> for the sake of the but, story. Like I said again, this is mm, yeah for the sake of getting to the ending. Um, but like I said, this is no indictment against, uh, you know, of Brandon Sanderson. He did a, a pretty mm -hmm. good job. No complaints. So what have you been, uh, reading <laughs> recently? Oh, well, that's, uh, I've, I've got a couple of ones. Um, a little while back I discovered the first law mm -hmm. series by Joe Abercrombie. I don't know whether you've heard of no, it. No, I've never heard of that. It's, um, mm, yeah, the first book is called The Blade Itself, and the, the, it's a trilogy at the, this point. So the second book is Before They Are Hanged, and the third book is Last Argument of Kings. So is that before and, or after the author uh, started Abercrombie and Fitch? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> that would, uh, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> no, um, The Blade Itself is is. is it's a very good book, actually. I got the audiobook along with it, read by, if I'm not mistaken, our Nathan Pacey. And uh, it was very entertaining, in fact. Um, you've got this medieval fantasy setting. You've got uh, 
kind of a subdued, muted magic like you find in Game mm-hmm. of Thrones. Uh, you know, not not an obvious flashy magic like in Wheel yeah. of Time. Um, and you've got, you know, your your varying point of view again. You've got, you know, your fighter, uh, your, you know, various travels. Like you've got your one fighter. You've got a one guy training to be, uh, to fight in the big contest that's coming to the city. Um, and yeah, <laughs> sorry, I mucked up this bit again a bit. Um, so does that like uh, start off kind um, of a tournament or? Yeah, they. I think it it ends on the kind of day of the tournament. So a big central um, event in the first book definitely is this this big tournament, and then by the time the second book starts, you start to realize how. Um, some of the events in the first book has been, you know, have been uh, manipulated by one of the characters. Okay. Uh, and it starts to become a bit more clear that, okay, this story is starting to gain some serious direction and some serious mem- momentum. But I have to admit this, this story is incredibly good on a, like a scene by scene basis and paragraph by paragraph, sentence by sentence. It's very entertaining. The language is well done. The characters are well done. Um, but where I feel slightly less impressed is like on a on a more grand scheme of things, uh, a bigger scale, like story wise. Um, it's not that the story is bad. It's that, for instance, like in the beginning of the second book, before they are hanged, the characters set out on a particular mm-hmm. quest that took almost the whole first book to pull all these characters together into a single party, and now they set out. They go through all of this, the whole second book um, follows them as they go on this quest and do everything, and by the end of the second book, something happens, and they kind of return, and everything is... And suddenly you realize, well, look, there's been a lot of progress in terms of characters, in terms of you know character dynamics, character development, but if you look at the actual plot, the story itself, not a lot, you know... <laughs> they ended their quest, and they end up right back where they where they were, where they started, and nothing's changed. They they they, you know. I'm trying not to yeah. give any spoilers, but it it is a bit difficult. Yeah. So like even so uh, on to, the worst end of what we were talking about with Game of Thrones, like not much happens, mm-hmm. and it feels like it doesn't really affect them very much. Is that what you mean? Well. Perhaps, like in Game of Thrones, at the very least, you can say, well, you know, not a lot has happened, it just happened slowly. In Before They Are Hanged, how it's different is by the end of the book you realize, oh crap, they may as well have just left out this whole quest. <laughs> they, they, it just, the whole thing just collapses and it hasn't done mm-hmm. anything. Now, I will grant you, if in the third book they go on, I still have to finish the third book, just yeah. so you know, if they go on and it turns out that they did, in fact, gain something from this quest. Then I might go, oh, okay, in that case, it was necessary. But at this moment, the whole second book feels like it's in the middle, and it, you could almost have left it out. <laughs> Not to be mean about it, but it's just a kind of a sense of it. Yeah, that would, that would feel frustrating. It, it almost uh, seems kind of like the second Matrix movie. You could just leave that one out, and it doesn't really affect much. <laughs> it does. It does feel like that. Oh, before I forget, that's that's the third character I forgot to mention. He is the best character that I've seen in a book in a long time. Is uh, Inquisitor Glockta, which is this... His character work on that character is just fantastically done. Um, he's an ex-soldier who got captured after the previous war. He got tortured, and now he kind of hobbles around. He's, you know, his one leg is ruined. He's in permanent pain. And now he acts as an inquisitor in the city and he questions other people and he inflicts pain, torture, you might say, uh, in turn, which makes him an incredibly nuanced character because he knows what it's like to suffer pain and now he inflicts it. And I must say, sorry, uh, <laughs> yeah. I had to mention this because this is, this character is definitely one of my favorite characters I've ever uh, come so... across. Is he the bad guy, good guy? That is the fantastic thing about him. He is not either. <laughs> he, 
you know, in terms of he goes around, he does things. He's definitely a protagonist from the point of mm-hmm. view of the story. Uh, you know, his story is being told most of the time. I think in book one, he feels like the main person that, you know, you're following his story. You definitely want him to succeed, even as you watch him do these horrific things to people, which is, I stopped at some point during the first book and I thought to myself, this is crazy, actually, how this author has manipulated me. <laughs> this, this character is quite obviously a nasty piece of a human being, but, you know, you, <laughs> when he gets to, you know, when, when a meeting of his is set up with his superior and he thinks by himself, oh, uh, you know, for all I know, next thing I know, I'll be floating next to the docks because my boss is unhappy <laughs> with me. You kind of feel for him. You feel, oh, I hope nothing yeah. happens to him. <laughs> but that definitely be so. Yeah, definitely a good uh, uh, character study then with uh, that particular mm. character, like uh, definitely making your villain. Uh, making the audience empathize with the villain, rather. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Very interesting. I should read that. Hmm, <laughs> I can highly recommend it. And then, uh, in terms of more books, I don't know, um, I've recently started reading The Name of the Wind from, you know, by Patrick. Okay, Rufus. yeah, I, uh, and I definitely, uh, I've heard about that and I really want to read that too. Um, interestingly with yeah, Patrick Rothfuss, I'm sorry to interrupt there, but, uh, are yeah, you familiar no with, uh, Penny Arcade, the web comic? Uh, yes. I they, am. uh, mm. actually invited him along to one of their expos and they did, uh, a, uh, Dungeons and Dragons thing with him. So he's, he's a pretty oh, nice. major geek. Ah, oh, Lovely. Yes, I think you can see some of that in in the book. Um, at the moment, I haven't finished it yet, but uh, it's it's a pretty standard fantasy setup. It's really mm-hmm. well written, and it's also mainly character based. So it's you know there's not a lot of big events yet. It's mainly this this character is quite enigmatic, and you find yourself really wondering, you know what's going on with this guy and luckily the whole story is based on him telling his story to a scribe so you end up learning where he comes from nice varied fantasy world can't complain but if he's uh if he's telling the story to his scribe there then we already know that he survives so i'm wondering where the uh where does the conflict come in uh, if you've if you've been able to read enough to kind of see that well, there, there definitely are events happening in, in the present of the story. So, you know, you've got uh, crazy spider-like creatures coming down out of the mountains, and that's definitely happening in the present of the story. So some hints this character drops, you know, he seems outwardly to be just another mm-hmm. innkeeper, but the way he speaks to his apprentice or, you know, to his assistant you definitely realize, well, they know more about these creatures than they're letting on to the rest of the people in the village. So I think there's definitely... I haven't finished it yet, unfortunately, but there's definitely uh, potential for for present tense conflict, if I can okay. put it that way. Uh, I think I think a part of the story is going to be him telling it, and the other part, there, there's definitely some potential for conflict in the present. Because that's always the thing that I worry about uh, if I was to ever kind of do a story in that style. Like, if you already know that the mm-hmm. character is going to survive a conflict, uh, kind of, again, bring up Game of Thrones there, like, that's why he does it so well, is because, like, there is a chance that they won't. But if you're doing it kind of in that mm-hmm. past, present uh, uh, juxtaposition, like, uh, how would you bring up a conflict that kind of um, gets you invested in that? It's like, oh, there's the fight again. Oh, of course, the main character is going to survive. We already know that. <laughs> yeah, that, that is a question. It is, it's definitely a challenge. Uh, I must admit there have been times where a, uh, an author has woven such a tight story that even if you know the character will survive, you find yourself kind of being pulled into that 
uh, story so much that you still uh, find yourself tense and worried mm-hmm. for the character. Um, but that has to be done really yeah. well, I think. That really needs a, a magic <laughs> touch to pull off. Which is something one can work at, I suppose. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, definitely a challenge. Very interesting. I'm going to have to pick that up. I keep meaning to, but... <laughs> mm. <laughs> Uh, but if you're looking for something to pick up, I would almost recommend, before anything else, uh, the book I'm currently reading. Uh, it's called The Lies of Locke Lamora by Scott Oh, yeah, Lynch. you mentioned uh, Scott um, Lynch there before. This is, yeah, this is a very cool book. I don't want to give away too much, so I won't spoil it, because it is, it's kind of like a medieval heist book, a little bit, um, with a couple of thieving characters setting up a big score. And it's a lot of fun to read, I must say, this book. Even on just a page-by-page basis, you can read almost any combination of two pages from anywhere in the book, and you will find some entertainment value in it. Even out of context, you know, I mean, just literally the way it's written, the language, is quite entertaining. So, yeah, I must say, I'm I'm very impressed. And I feel like (laughs) for waiting so long to pick up this book, because I see there's already (laughs) three more. So, so is that the first in the series? Or? But uh, this is this is the first in the I think it's called the Gentleman Bastard series, um, which is yeah. So yeah, that's a that's at the moment is my favorite book. But as I said before, <laughs> my favorite book typically tends to be the one I'm reading <laughs> at the moment. So yeah, maybe I'll have to pick up that. Uh, <laughs> Lies of Lachlan Lamora. Maybe we'll have to uh, talk about that further. Maybe even give it a, a review in a mm. future podcast there. I think most <laughs> definitely that would be my favorite choice at the moment for doing the review on. So I'm hoping to do that in the near future. Yeah, I'll have, have to pick that up. Fun. So uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time there today. Uh, we were going to talk about a little bit of uh, TV that we're watching, but uh, we've gone a little bit over time. We uh, Talked a little bit too much, I think, about the things that we're loving with uh, reading. So <laughs> so we'll have to uh, cut it off here. But uh, audience, uh, why don't you let us know what you're reading recently and uh, let us know in the comments there and why you like it, uh, what you don't like about it maybe, uh, and uh, just maybe we'll uh, even pick up one of your novels and read it and talk about it. Mm-hmm. So uh, thank you for joining us here at Second Drafts Podcast. Uh, Please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on everything you need to write, edit, and publish your way. And let us know what you'd like to see from us in future podcasts. See you next time. Do you want to support production of this YouTube series? Visit www.patreon.com slash and become a patron today.